not compare notes, so what a terrific story. I, I can't wait to hear who you met. Uh, I will say that opening concert was 19 years ago, and in that time the museum has welcomed almost 10 million visitors. Remarkable, truly remarkable. So I've been honored to be connected to a place like the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And prior to that, I also had a distinct honor being at the Baseball Hall of Fame. Two places that mean so much to so many. They have this broad base of appeal, they have this connection, they have the incredible ability to teach and to inspire through their subjects. Think about rock and roll as a museum. The people that come through our front door, in fact, all of us, have a reservoir of this music. Even if you're not a huge fan, there's a song that meant something to you in seventh grade. There's a song that defined the greatest road trip you ever took. There's a song that gave you solace when you needed it. And there's one that inspired you. When folks come into our orbit, if we can just touch that, great things happen. And maybe that sense of wonder comes out. That's a real leg up. Other museums, I believe, have some of that. But we're pretty unusual when you think about it. People dance to this at the most important day of their life, and they go to it. So this morning, I want to talk a little bit about how we take that, we take our artifacts, and we combine them with the music itself, the art, and then how we tell these stories in a broader context and share some of those stories with you. I also want to start by talking a little bit about how we acquire and consume music, because it's, as all of us know, it's changed. But let's look at that first. That thing on the top, <laughs> right? The car radio. It's emblematic of all the other radios. You could have done a litany of radios from the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, all the way up. A crystal radio, a transistor radio this size to listen to music. You would listen and you'd wait for the DJ to tell you what you heard. Or you'd try and memorize or remember one of the verses or, or the chorus or something so you knew what the song was. That was the key to understand what the music was. You heard it and you had to sort of somehow grab it. Later in the late 70s and 80s, if you were lucky enough, you had one of these big gray boxes up there. And when the song was on the radio, you pushed the buttons quickly. And you recorded a bunch of it on a cassette tape, right? So you could play it back over and over again. Either way you, you grabbed it, whether it was off the radio from the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s on up, or a cassette tape, if you wanted to own something permanent that wasn't an off-air cheapie, you had to go to a record store or a department store that sold records or someplace that you could buy them. This shot up here is emblematic of record stores. Having owned a record store, they're never this clean. I, <laughs> But you had to take that song that you heard and you had to go to a place and you had to physically buy it. And then you had to carry that home, open it up, put it on your turntable, and sit and listen. So think of what you invested in just getting to that point of listening. A lot of hours and a lot of shoe leather just to get there. And I believe when you did that, you listened differently. You wanted that to connect with you. You really wanted a connection because of the investment that you made. If it didn't connect, you might flip to the next song. You might flip to the B side if it was a 45. And if it really missed, I can remember doing this, you'd set it aside, but you'd pick it up again in a couple days because you did all that work and you really wanted to connect with this. I think you know where I'm going. Today, think about how we're all acquiring our music. Somebody's sending us a link. You're reading an article about something and they reference it and you click on it. Invariably, you end up at a place like YouTube, you end up at a spot like Spotify, Rhapsody, whatever it is, and you click on the song and you can read and learn and they're recommending other songs and there's other connections you can make. It's a common bias to think your way is the best way. When I shared this story with a friend who's a noted blues collector, he spent years chasing those records. 
he carried a list in his wallet. In whatever city he was in, he'd go to the record store and try and find the records he needed. And he floored me by saying, my 18-year-old daughter knows more about the blues than I'll ever know. And the reason is, on her laptop, his 18-year-old daughter could start with Stevie Ray Vaughan, who we just heard. Got to play him if you're in Texas, I was told. <laughs> could start with that. And his Sky is Crying might lead you to Elmore James, the original recorder of Sky is Crying. Just by that was the Stevie Ray pages there, it mentions Elmore James. You click on it. You see Elmore James actually performing the song. And then you click on that. Elmore James was from Chicago, actually from the Delta, but he lived in Chicago. And it steers you to, to uh, Howlin' Wolf. And you're watching a movie of Howlin' Wolf actually performing without having left your kitchen table. And in that clip, somebody mentions that watched it as well. Somebody in Belgium leaves a note that says his backing band is over here. And you click on that link, and it's Bob Dylan playing at Newport, being backed by Howard Wolf's band. Think about that. It's unbelievable what is accessible and what is available and how you acquire the music and the depth of knowledge that you can gain. I'm not saying one way is better than the other, but they are different ways, and we have to recognize that. Let's go to sort of museums and how we tell our stories. Pretty recognizable museum. The Louvre in Paris, the bastion of great European art, sort of symbolically the home of the Mona Lisa, truly the home, not just symbolically, Leonardo's masterpiece. The pyramid in the front was designed by the Chinese-born architect I.M. Pei. Here's I.M. Pei's other pyramid. That's our museum. It is the center of America's great art form, rock and roll. It contains many artifacts. The guitar on the front, that's Bruce Springsteen's iconic guitar. I could have put Paul Simon's iconic guitar there. We have a new Paul Simon exhibit, by the way. The guitar that he recorded, you know, Bridge Over Troubled Water, The Boxer, that same guitar could have been there. The interesting thing is that guitar, Bruce Springsteen's guitar, they're not our Mona Lisa. They're analogous to Leonardo's brushes. They're the tools that made the art. The art isn't the guitar. The art is his songs, Born to Run, Thunder Road, Jungle Land. That's the art. As a museum, we have this incredible opportunity, this reservoir of connection that people have. We can take these artifacts, we can combine them with the art itself so you can hear the songs and then tell the story in the context that the song was created in. And that's where you get your real strength. Let's do that with a few things. Let's look at this guitar, another Fender. It's Joe Strummer's guitar from the band The Clash. And here's a photo of the band. The guitar, well, let's start with the band. So The Clash comes on the scene in the 70s. And there's a real need in the music community. You have the Ramones, The Clash, The Sex Pistols. They were a direct reaction to a very synthetic era. Produced, overproduced music, or produced music, highly produced music, synthetic clothing, strip balls, and sort of this need for these bands, they wanted to be authentic. They wanted to be looked at and strip it down as far as possible. The Clash and the Ramones looked for their roots in the 50s music. I'd say they kind of captured it in their look. This guitar was a guitar that Joe Strummer bought just before forming The Clash in a band called the 101ers. And it was brand new. He immediately made it look old. He covered it with auto body primer, sanded it down, put stickers on it. And the whole reason was to look as authentic as the music they wanted to make. They combined them together. And let's hear that guitar in action with the music and see if they achieved what they were going for. Back one. Sorry about that. Let's play it. 
I think they got what they were going for, don't you? And it's not lost on many here that that's the cover of Bobby Fuller's I Fought the Law. Let's look at another example of this. That was taking a broad context. This is a more local context. The name Doc Pomus likely isn't familiar to many people in this room. Doc Pomus is in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. The way he's exhibited in our museum, when you come through our front door, you go through the roots of rock and roll, gospel, blues, country, R&B. After the roots, you go through Elvis. And then you go into an area where we tell the story of rock and roll through cities and scenes. And there's a very large case that is the golden age of 1950s rock and roll. In that case, Buddy Holly, the Everly Brothers, Dion, Chuck Berry, Bo Diddley, Bill Haley, Eddie Cochran, all names you've heard. Dead center in that case is Doc Pomus. Doc is there because he's a songwriter. He wrote songs that you all know. This Magic Moment, um, Teenager in Love, um, Viva Las Vegas. So he's in pretty good company. The way he's exhibited is this black and white photo that you see up there. And he's at a microphone. He was a blues singer in the 40s. He became a songwriter in the late 40s throughout the 50s. And he's at a microphone singing. And if you look, he has crutches under his arms. He had polio as a child, with, wore leg braces, wore crutches through his teen years and his adult life, and later was in a wheelchair. And he always had them. Right next to that photo is this white card. And the white card is his wedding invitation. And Doc, at his own wedding, watched his new bride dance with the best man, dance with her father, dance with her uncle, dance with her brother. And he wrote on these cards, and he wrote, save the last dance for me. When I said that, you heard the song. Powerful. That was the local context for it. That specific spot gave him the idea. And then he went home and he took the other invitations and he wrote the song. The song became a hit for the Drifters, number one pop and R&B. But let's take a moment, let's listen to the song, and then I've, we've added something to the song. And there's some footage from an incredible documentary about Doc Pomus um, that was done by Clear Lake Productions called AKA Doc Pomus. But let's hear the song and think of that local context and think about how it connects with all of us. should be rolling. There's footage on top of this. Okay. Bear with us one second. There we go. You can dance every dance with the guy who gives you the eye and let him hold you tight you can smile every smile for the man who held your hand beneath the pale moonlight but don't forget who's taking you home and in whose arms you're gonna be so darling say the last dance for me Oh, I know, oh, I know that the music's yes, fine, know. like sparkling oh, wine. Go and have your yes, fun. I know. Oh, I know. Laugh and sing. Yes, I know. But while we're all oh, hard, don't give your yes, heart to anyone. Oh, but yes, don't forget who's taking you home and in whose arms you're gonna be. So, darling, say, say the last dance for me. The context, think about that context. I believe that context is what makes the song so great. 
without even knowing the story, it's what made the story real. It's what gave it something that we all understood. Let's look at the context again, but in a much broader way. This is John Lennon um, with a guitar, a very famous guitar. This guitar is on exhibit at our museum. He used it throughout the 60s with the Beatles, so great songs like Help are recorded with this song. As the Beatles were winding down, um, John and Yoko did a series of bed-ins in Montreal and Toronto to raise awareness for the Vietnam War. And this is a shot of him at one of the bed-ins with his guitar. They brought microphones into the hotel room and they recorded the song, Give Peace a Chance. The song was released in April of 1969. It's the first release for record collectors as the Beatles were dissolving. It's the first release by any Beatle that's not a Beatles release. It was released by the Plastic Ono Band on Apple Records. In the song, I think we're familiar with it, but let's listen to a little bit of the song coming from this guitar. Two, one, two, three, four. <laughs> So from that guitar in April of 1969, that's a small part of the story. We know why he wrote the song. In the fall of 1969, there was a series of demonstrations around the United States, very well organized, culminating in one in Washington in November of 1969, in which 500,000 people stood on the steps of the Washington Monument down the reflecting pool to draw awareness and demonstrate against the Vietnam involvement. Pete Seeger led the crowd that day, Hall of Fame inductee, by the way, and he led them in this song. And he said, I didn't like the song. It's kind of monotonous. It doesn't have a lot of variety. But when I saw a half a million people singing the song together and swaying, I knew it was powerful and I knew it was important. Newsweek magazine interviewed some of the demonstrators and they ran it the following week. And one of the demonstrators really captured it. They said, our movement has no leader, but now we have a song and every great movement needs a song. That brings the question for all of us, what are our songs? What are the things that people will look at in 50 years and say moved us? What inspires us? What are the things that can help us engage, teach, and inspire each other? And what are our songs? Thank you, everyone.